All right, so I have a lot of slides. We, it'll take a long time to get through. And the people in the back are really laughing because they know I have zero slides. They make up a slide for me every year because I don't like PowerPoint. It's one of the things I like about wilderness medicine is the fact that we actually get to make up things and pretend things and not be inside and not do all these things. Like I'd rather be outside doing a lot of things than standing here. And, okay, next, next, you know, Bueller, Bueller, where we're going with that. But, you know, there's a, there's a certain point where you need to have the academic portion of it, right? So we talk about what's the curriculum. So what is a curriculum? All right, we've got all the residents from Omonides. Somebody, you pick, pick whoever you want. One of you has to tell me what a curriculum is. General terms, Wikipedia, somebody, I'm sure someone has their phone. You can figure out what is it? What's a curriculum? Pardon me? Okay, an agenda for learning. Okay, so don't most of us have that into everything we go into? That's just shaking your head. It's like, no. Sometimes we just stumble into things, right? We, we end up in these situations and we're like, oh, hey, that's pretty cool. How did I do that? Like, like Jim was talking about, you know, he did some research on middle ear squeeze and Sudafed, probably because he had a question. Like, hey, I wonder if this is going to work. And then you're like, hey, this might work. Maybe I can translate this into something else and see. And it can give me a chance to knock off that academic project without having to do something really stupid that I don't want to do, right? Like ED throughput or left without being seen rate or whatever. You know, which that's, those are all Jay's like metrics. The world he lives in, that's a, the wilderness of administration is a whole different wilderness. But, you know, thinking about it, you have an agenda for what you want to learn. So how do you figure that out? How do you develop that? Well, that's what you're here for. So the great news is there's actually a couple of decent resources out there. There's one for medical student elective, sort of the curriculum for medical student elective. That was done by Stephanie LaRoe maybe two or three, maybe four years ago. And they really looked at what do you need to have, what are the components you need to have in a wilderness medicine elective, right, like to give someone a meaningful experience. And then Walt, I think, did one for a residency track. Um, and that was, that, that's been how many years ago, four or five? Okay. So you guys did it after Stephanie then? And so they look at how you can do it, because you're doing it longitudinally, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Stanford had something similar that they started for medical students through sort of longitudinally starting at the beginning. So, but the, the point is you have to have an idea of what you want to get out of it. So you can develop your own curriculum. You can develop your own idea. It's, it really should be what you want, right? What do you want to get out of it? So for somebody to say, these are the things you have to do. We had a consensus agreement on, you know, basically agreement on what needs to be covered in a wilderness medicine fellowship. And that you can look that up and see what are the topics and sort of the content of knowledge you need, which is similar to the folks in emergency medicine when you look at sort of the, the global fund of knowledge you need to have to pass the, the boards and to, to be a practicing emergency physician. Fortunately, there are no boards for wilderness medicine, right? We don't want to be GME funded if, or GME recognized. Those people that want that, I, I totally disagree. Get off my soapbox now. Well, I mean, think about it, because then you have someone telling you, you have to do this. Like Stuart was saying, we have a variety of programs throughout the country. I'm in North Carolina. We do not have avalanches. We have flabalanches, right? Because you know, we've got biscuits and gravy. And we have Bojangles, we have Biscuitville. We have restaurants devoted just to biscuits, OK? <laughs> I mean, we even have a whole group of people called chronic biscuit poisoning, OK? We have people who come in because they, they like biscuits. <laughs> so you know, we're not going to see the avalanche. Those folks are, the wilderness is having to park you know, in the parking lot, not in the handicapped spot. You know, this is really bad for them. It's like tough. Oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to make that, that long walk. But, you know, you, you can't have something that says this is absolutely what you have to do. There's some basic things that I think everyone would agree on for wilderness medicine for if you want to say what your curriculum would be. You really need to be able to adapt and to improvise. So kind of the old, I was military years ago, so adapt, overcome, and improvise. Sort of the same sort of things. Like what is, what is, the, you know, what is the challenge that you're going to be facing? What environment are you going to be in? The first thing is, can you survive in that environment? So really, for any sort of wilderness uh, curriculum, I would say, is what environment do you want to practice in? And then develop a way for you to learn to, to manage the skills and learn those skills that you can thrive in that environment. You know, you want to do hypoxia research and you get a high altitude headache when you come to Denver? Probably not going to be a really pleasant time, right? Puking in a tent is no fun when you're, doing, you know, when you're trying to do something. I mean, unless that's all you want to do is puke in a tent. <laughs> but, 
you know, it's just like you've got to be ready to, to function in that environment. And that's one of the things that we forget about in the curriculum side of wilderness medicine. We can come to these courses and learn how to do, you know, learn how to do all these cool things like we're going to show you how to make a traction, you know, a traction splint with toothpicks, a toothbrush, a camp cup, and the coffee maker back there, right? We will if you want to, but please don't ever put a traction splint on anybody in the woods, right? I mean, what's the first thing you do with a traction splint when they come to the emergency department? Take it off. So now you've made this thing that's huge and long, and it takes a Chinook to, to get the person out of the backcountry, you know, because you're like, oh, we've got to do this. They, most people will have another leg. Not all, most will have another leg. Just strap it to that. We'll talk about that later. But think about how can you function in that environment? How do you, how do you survive in that environment, right? But to, to actually do wilderness medicine, you can't just survive. You can't be one of the victims. You have to be one of the, one of the people who thrives in that environment. So if you're going to go do disaster medicine, you're going to go do some relief work, you're going to go do mission work, you've got to be able to take care of yourself in that environment. So many people show up in these places for these you know, events, and they are not prepared. Then they become another albatross, right? And you're just like, oh, dear, what are we going to do with these people? I just call them mobile sandbags most of the time. You, know, you can maybe point them in a direction, but they really can't do anything, right? And it's, it's kind of like they're almost like a, a med student, right? Remember, the med students are like golden retrievers, right, for the, the med students out there. <laughs> So, really, because you're like, think about, what's everyone think about when you think of a golden retriever? Like a happy, super excited, like energetic dog, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. You want to play with me? Absolutely. You want to give me attention? Yeah, awesome. Yeah. With a ball? Sure, sure, sure. sure. I'll bring you four balls, you know? <laughs> and they're just, they just need direction, though, right? And so, but that's, that's, it's a great thing. Don't lose that, right? Because we lose that when we get old and cynical and jaded and you've worked a lot of shifts and people scream at you and yell at you and throw feces at you and they're not, they're not baboons, right? You know, you're like, God bless, are you kidding me? I'm not a zookeeper. Why do I keep getting poop flung at me? <laughs> you know, it, and it happens. You know, you, it will happen. It's okay. But keep that energy because there's so many cool things about medicine. And that's the great part about wilderness medicine and allow you to design your own curriculum. You can do this. You can do anything you want with wilderness medicine. And so you, you can have, you can say, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to do some fun things. So to design a curriculum, the first thing you want to do is think about where you want to be, where that, where that activity is going to take place, right? Because so much of it is situational. Doing, you know, marine medicine, deep sea medicine is totally different than high altitude medicine. Doing, doing desert medicine is totally different than, than, you know, the savanna of Africa, right? So there's a whole lot of different things that you can think about. Where are you going to be? I'm in the southeast, we get, a lot of, we get a lot of cool stuff, but it's totally different than out here. So thinking about where, I, where do I want to practice that? And you can have different, different modules and learn different skills. And then just the basic thing of how do I take what I have up here, right? What do I have, my fund of knowledge, my experience that I, that I gain in conferences and in you know, my rotations and you know, doing my regular shifts, and how do I translate it when I'm outside of that setting, when I'm outside in a, in a non academic setting, a non-clinical setting. So I'm on the trail, I'm on the street, I'm on a soccer field, I'm in the parking lot at Walmart, I'm, you know, on an overpass at Katrina, you know, I'm hanging out, at, you know, San, you know, after, after Long Island, you know, on Long Island, after Hurricane Sandy. You know, you can have a wilderness setting anywhere. I, I do a lot of remote sort of, like, whitewater trips, but most of my wilderness medicine has honestly been done on soccer fields and, like, sports fields with my kids or other kids where you're like, oh, I guess we can fix that here. That's okay. Um, but with medical students, medical students are, are excited and they want to do stuff. So that's why for the curriculum for that, you can easily say, what do you want to do? We started a new program with the students at Wake this year during intern or during the, in, like their intern, not intern orientation, but first year orientation. We, had, we bring them in and we do a patient assessment. We do like anaphylaxis. We do a couple little, little super easy scenarios for them just to get them used to team building and working in outside of the classroom, and it's a great thing. They love it. They want us to do it again. We started a conference for medical students 12 years ago, and we had it every year for medical students geared towards medical students to learn things about wilderness medicine. We have workshops on suturing. We have ultrasound. We have you know, airway stuff. We have lectures on traveler's diarrhea, altitude illness, ropes and knots. We also have, like, usually someone brings all the venomous, you know, venomous snakes in North Carolina, which is usually a big hit. 
with the, everyone but the security guards. You know, they're like, um, are those snakes real? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're totally fine. It's okay. We, did you get your free T-shirt? That's what we always give the security guards free T-shirts and lunch just so they don't really cause too much of a, like, do you have a permit for that? You know, it's the South. We can kind of get away with that. We usually have snakes. Usually it's with church, but we do it at a school too, so it's not bad. Um, so what questions do you all have about curriculum? I mean, really, I'm putting it back on you because you have to decide what you want to do. What do you want to get out of it? And, and then how you would develop that. My, my information will be somewhere we'll have our contact information. I'm happy to talk offline about how you can set things up. If you need help with kind of talking to your program director or from medical student side, those sort of things, and the folks with simulation, there's a lot of opportunities out there to make those things going. And the gentleman who wants to do medical student involvement, I've got a great, great plan for that. It's just, you know, I'm happy to help and share all those things because that's really part of what this group is, is to connect you with people who are interested in some of the same things and to help you kind of develop your, your skill set and your knowledge base and share that with the other folks in the room. So what, what questions are anything? Yeah. So I think the fundamentals you need, that's a great idea. Just have your fundamentals of like, this is how you manage, this is how you manage this particular type of a patient. And then you have a local module as far as for this environment, you're going to do it this way. So when you think about like heat illness or cold illness, you're going to manage it differently in the arid environment than a wet environment or in the southeast versus the northwest, right? So having, the, having that with sort of plug and play with different modules, that's, that's probably the best way to go. If you're if you're looking at specific specific tasks, what else? Have you ever found a way to get medical students like sort of actively involved in something like search and rescue? Like I'm just thinking, a lot of it is you know like scenarios in the woods, and which is awesome, you know, awesome and fun and things like that. I had tried to get a medical student to look at search and rescue stuff, and it was so like hard to get through their training and everything. But I think if it was more So, so we do have the Appalachian Mountain Rescue team has started in our in our area, and we have several medical students who are involved with that, and a couple and one our EMS fellow is involved with that. Um, but they started as the group fa founded, so it was a little bit easy. So now we have a pathway for that. Um, it's going to be a little bit easier for that than it is a traditional search and rescue group because they have pretty strict volunteer requirements, and they have a lot of requirements that they want you to take and courses they want you to take. It's like volunteering with ski patrol. Right? They want you to take OEC, and you're like, well, I'm a doctor. It doesn't matter. OEC, OEC, OEC. You know, it's like the only thing they can say. And so <laughs> it's like you have to take ACLS, BLS, PALS, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, well, whatever. Just show me the patient. I'll take care of them. Um, so if you, you know, that's one thing that you could get. You, you would need the physician to make that connection with whoever the physician leader is of that group and then set that up. So that's where having the medical student having a, like a mentor or having someone that can be that sort of gateway for them. And, and I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to knock on doors for you. Um, but kind of pushing that, that through and saying, hey, look, we're going to cover this sort of thing for them. Can they come in in an observation role? You know, it's going to be hard to be in any sort of a deployable thing. Sorry, I was trying to make sure that it didn't go over. All right. Um, to make sure they're in any, any deployable thing so that they don't miss a lot of activities from school or from that. It's, it's much easier when you're out of residency to do those things than it is. You can do them in residency, but it's a little bit more difficult. You know, we've had folks do deploy with disaster teams and that sort of thing, and it's, it's a little bit harder on the residency because of funding issues. Anything else? Thank you all. Oh, well, yeah. So the, the publication that Stephanie LaRoe did a couple years ago, they, they have that. They have the guidelines for what you need to cover in that. And so that's, that's really it because this is just a group of people that get together, right? When you think about the organizational body for wilderness medicine, the WMS wants to be it, but they're not. They're not very academic. They're not very organized. They're a bunch of old, old dudes. Okay, and I can say that as an old dude. Um, you know, well, it's okay. I can say that. 
you know, you, you're not pointing fingers if it's pointing back at you, um, but they're, you know, they really haven't been very sort of cohesive in organizing things together. I feel like SAM and ASAP both have interest groups, and they have been a lot more involved and a lot more active in putting together, say, hey, these are consensus documents, these are things that we feel that need to be covered. Um, so that's where most of that information is going to come from, from SAM and, and ASAP, which are really our, our leaders in our field, you know, go, knowing that the Wilderness Medical Society, anyone from any specialty can join. And it's great. In, the, in theory, it's a great opportunity because it's an umbrella organization that would cover all people. They just haven't done a lot with that. Um, they've, they've had a medical student elective for several years. Now they've started one out west. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities for that. So my time is up. Thank you all.